right. Oh, wow. Isn't it awesome to trust Jesus? Wow. You know, um, oh, man, I grew up a little girl, always loved an adventure, and the best adventure I've ever had and that I ever will have and the, for the rest of my life is to know Jesus. I'll tell you, he'll take you on a ride. <laughs> yeah, he sure will. Um, oh, it's so great to be in the presence of God. I'm going to start out right now. I'll just give you a little disclaimer about my, the message and what I'm saying. Um, this week for me just went sideways. And um, so everything that I've written down took place at the side of my husband's bed in the ER. <laughs> and I thought I was going to have all these, my plans. You know, I set aside Thursday and Friday. It was going to be quiet time with the Lord and all of that. And I'm so thrilled that that didn't happen. Um, I didn't even know really what I was writing down um, at the hospital. I just knew take my Bible and take my notebook. And, um, and I love the Holy Spirit. He is so real to me. And I pray all the time, um, Lord, let me hear your voice. I don't want to hear mine. I don't have a solution to anything. Um, I don't have an answer to anything. But when God speaks... Um, it's amazing. And so anyway, when I got home on, you know, Friday and yesterday, I'm, I'm looking through this notebook, and I went, well, a little daunting to think that this was enough. It certainly wasn't any kind of, you know, where I'd gone to Bible school and did it all right, but there it is, and here it is. So I'm just going to bring it to you this morning the way God gave it to me at the side of my husband's <laughs> bed in the ER when I didn't know what was happening. Um, he led me first to uh, John 14. So I'm just going to read some verses to you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And this is Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. So let him speak to you. He's talking to you this morning. He's talking to me. This is true today. This is what he's saying today. His word is eternal. And whatever's going on in our world, this is what he says. Let not your heart be troubled. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and you've seen him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him. He dwells with you and he will be in you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Jesus spoke these words 50 days before Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit, he promised, came upon those gathered who believed him and were waiting he was with his chosen, very human disciples at that supper, no different than you and me. He knew what was coming for himself and for them, and they did not. Imagine yourself and set yourself in the upper room. They are gathered in the upper room the night before his crucifixion, they're stumbling at his words and trying without success to interpret what was coming through the faulty lens of their hopes and their dreams. 
Just think of that. We do that. We have our hopes. We have our dreams. And it's a faulty lens because God's word comes and pierces even our hopes and our dreams. Our lenses are faulty, but his is not. The next hours were going to be filled with chaos, violence. Do you know the word violence in Hebrew is Hamas? Denial, betrayal, pain, lies, confusion, despair, anger, fear, bewilderment, and shock. Does that sound familiar? Satan would be unleashing his whole arsenal in order to destroy God's intrusion into his evil kingdom. He was going to let loose everything to annihilate him because Satan was determined to keep this kingdom that he thought he owned and could keep. Today, the world is reeling in shock at how evil evil really is. But we should not be shocked, dear ones. We've been told and we've been instructed by God himself if we read and believe his word. There in the upper room with all that is before them, Jesus makes his staggering, this staggering promise. There is someone who is coming who will take his place here on earth. This one that Jesus says will comfort them somehow, will guide them and teach them somehow, and empower them to do all that Jesus says they can do to turn the world upside down. I think they were just trying to think, how in the world am I going to survive? He tells them they can overcome evil in the power of this someone that he calls the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. And they did, and he's still here, comforting, guiding into all truth, leading and empowering the followers of Christ. Believe me, dear friends, you cannot get through what is coming soon. In our future, without knowing and being indwelt and being baptized into this someone, the Holy Spirit. He is the third God of the Trinity. He is God, and God has sent him and he is for us, and he is here, and he is present. And you can know him, and he speaks, and you can hear him, and you can obey him, and he is personal, and he is as real as Jesus was to them. Every temple built by God for God is a fit dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. And you know, one of the theme verses for us is Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, where he's talking about us being, um, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. He's dwelling here in our midst. He's accessible. He has come near, and we've come near to him. That building is the church. That building is we believers. It's always being built, and it is a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Just as the tabernacle in the wilderness was where God dwelt at the mercy seat, at the Ark of the Covenant, that's where God dwelt. And then when the permanent temple was built, which was destroyed twice, and on your table you'll see illustrations, that's what that represents, is the temple. And those stones there represent you. You're built together. You're knit together. This is a temple. We have a temple in heaven. God, is, God loves temples. <laughs> he calls you a temple. 
So dig into that. Let the Holy Spirit speak that to you, just as the temple in the wilderness and the temple in Jerusalem was during the time of the sacrifices. God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, still dwells where his temple is. Where is it? Right here. In Christ, now, his temple is a living and breathing temple made of living stones who are the born again in Christ Jesus, who are a new creation, children of God, you and me. We've gathered here today with many mixed emotions that we've carried into this place from our broken and our war-torn world. There's no better place to be than in him and therefore in his presence. For where he is, there is peace. There is our salvation. That salvation given to us through and in Christ Jesus who provides all our needs. In salvation is health. In salvation is healing. In salvation is wholeness. In salvation is deliverance. In salvation is prosperity. God is here to meet you this morning and to provide for you all we need and all you need. We just sang about that, honey in the rock. God can bring life from impossible dead situations. In Christ, you were dead in your sins and he brought you to light. You were as dead as a stone and in Christ, you are alive. God is the God of the impossible. He's the God of miracles. There is nothing impossible for God. This is his world. This is his creation. He is ruler. He is king. The therefore, when it talks in this verse, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, uh, Paul points us back to a teaching that he says, he declares how outrageous in the face of what we're seeing in Israel today that there's no longer enmity and hatred between the Jews and the Gentile world, that in Christ the walls of hatred and cultural judgment and condemnation are torn down and annihilated because of the cross, where Jesus voluntarily laid his life down as a substitute sacrifice for us, that we might not only live, but that now we Gentiles can be brought near to the God of the Jews, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, so that we can be called God's chosen people, the apple of his eye. We just sang about that in Honey in the Rock. And we can receive all the promises that God intended for that nation. Truly, in the light of the hatred and evil we see, that reconciliation, it's an impossibility. It does not, you, you, you hear those words and you go, yeah, but. God sees with his eyes and he declares with his truth. This is truth, dear ones. No matter what we see, this is truth. The enmity has been destroyed. God has destroyed it. That's our stand. And when we go to war and we take a stand because we are at war, we're in Christ, and we are in a battle, a spiritual battle. This is what we stand on is truth. To the world, it looks like a lie, and it looks like a fairy tale, and it looks like you're nuts. But we've lined up with God and his truth. And that's the battle right there. That's the nugget of the battle. Truth versus a lie. You know, Satan is the father of lies. And we're going to declare truth. That's what God does. And it comes into being. God speaks and it happens. This is going to happen. That enmity is destroyed and it will be manifest destroyed someday. That's how God works. Truly, in light of the hatred and evil we see, we see that that's an impossibility in, a, in the natural only an all-powerful, omnipotent God could do that. And that is what Jesus Christ was and is. In our hopeless despair, he is the hope of the world, and he is the hope of Israel. The Old Testament in Isaiah 28 prophetically points us to Jesus when the Lord says, Behold, 
I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. It's an interesting verse, a interesting word. Um, last month, I touched on the importance and the absolute necessity of a cornerstone in a building where two walls come together and they rest on the cornerstone. Those walls, if you'll see in, in ruins, you know, often the, only the cornerstone, only the corner walls are left standing when it's bombed because they've been placed on a cornerstone. God uses that illustration for the surety of the fact that when we are set on the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ, we will not be toppled. We are a temple that will not be destroyed. The temple, the physical temple in Israel was destroyed twice, and it still lays in ruins. The temple that God built will not be destroyed. You will not be destroyed in Christ Jesus. Now you have eternal life, and there is nothing the evil one can do to you. So what? If our physical life goes, we don't die. What a joke on that evil one. What a turn of the tables God did. He's God. He's God. Satan doesn't scare him at all, and it shouldn't scare you. Be very aware of him, and we'll talk about that. In this verse, it's also an allusion to war and that there's no safety in buildings. When the bombs come, and we see that in the pictures of Gaza and what's happening, the people must flee hastily or be crushed. Our only, the only safety in a building, the temple that bought, God builds, is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. We can hopefully see and learn a great lesson from Israel right now. They know and unflinchingly and uncompromisingly identify their enemies. They know the enemy seeks nothing less than their total annihilation. We know that the enemy of Israel and all human beings is Satan. In the Old Testament, he's called Satan. In the New Testament, the devil often. And Jesus, where we just read here um, in John, called him the ruler of this world. He has a domain, and it's here. And the devil, he has brazenly exposed himself in these past days for the complete evil and darkness and death that he is, and that is his domain, and what his followers act like as they obey their evil master. There is no negotiating with Satan. You know, we send ambassadors, and we think we can have Abraham peace accords, and we can do all of these things, and we try. We try, and I'm not, I'm not condemning that. But there is no negotiation with evil. There's no compromise with evil. I'm here to set, tell you that. I'm, I'm. The unique history of evil that has been directed toward the nation of Israel and Jewish people as a whole is a mirror that should reflect back on all Christians if we will look. Satan hates us with the same hatred, and he will attack just as viciously if he can breach any walls or boundaries that we do not guard earnestly. The Lord led me to a verse late at night uh, this week, and it's 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all you do be done in love. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? My Irishness goes, oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> I get to pull out the, the sword. I get to get out my assault rifle. I get to hone my concealed weapon skills. Um, I'm going to do that. Let everything be done in love. Wow. But so many of the commands of Christ seem upside down to our natural minds. Know that. How do I fight and love at the same time? I believe I can do that because God would not have required that of me if I could not do it. See, this verse is a command. He's not suggesting it. I also know that I cannot do that in my own strength. Believe me, I have tried, 
And I haven't just failed some of the time, I fail all the time. Only as I choose to crucify the flesh, die to self, and choose to live by faith, and yield to the life of Christ in me, do I have victory. That is a serious battlefront, and we all walk it. And we're all here and should be here to encourage each other when we falter and all of us start to fall into our flesh. We are here to come alongside and encourage each other. No, Kathy, stop it. I don't see you that way. Step out in faith. You are who you are. Remind each other who you are in Christ. Only as I have come to know and believe by faith who I am in Christ have I been able to receive and believe the fact that I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's just that the all things now don't have to do with Kathy. <laughs> the all things now, I can do all things that God has called me to do. I wouldn't be standing here today, believe me, if I didn't trust that fact. God closes all the loopholes that Satan seeks to find, and believe me, that's what he looks for, is the loopholes. If we're not ignorant of God's promises to us, his faithfulness to us, and if we're not ignorant about the tactics of the enemy. God has a future for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. They are still God's chosen people. He made a covenant with them, and he will keep it. Jesus will return one day, and he will stand on that mount in Jerusalem. He will establish his kingdom rule there. The Bible says the Jews will in the end recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Hallelujah. And there are many Messianic Christian Jews in the world today, and they fervently pray for their people, as should we. We've been told to. We have been grafted into the promises that God originally gave to them. Our Christian history is a Jewish history. Our Messiah came to the world as a Jew. As he was rejected, so will we be. As he was crucified, so are we, spiritually and possibly physically. I don't know. As he was raised from the dead, so we are raised to life with him. The Christ follower, Paul, and that's what we are, we're Christ followers, stated, I have been crucified with Christ. He stated that while he was standing there but in front of them. So he's making this statement in the spirit. I have been crucified. That's how he considered himself. That's how he looked upon himself. That was his opinion of himself. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. The life that I now live, I live in the flesh. I live that I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the one who loved me and gave his life for mine. Paul is a great warrior example. If you want to see a warrior, there's one. This is where world logic gets turned upside down. As a little personal testimony on this theme, I claim membership in an organization called Daughters of the American Revolution because my relatives fought in that Revolutionary War that established this nation. I can claim membership in that organization, but I cannot claim bravery or heroism or loyalty because of them. I can only be grateful for their decisions, their fight, their bravery, and their deaths that brought my freedom and your freedom and this nation into being the same for many of the wars we've fought. I can only have that freedom in this nation for myself if I choose to keep, stand for, fight for what they paid so dear a price for. I come from a military family I'm peculiarly grateful for that heritage, and I come from an awareness of the military because I was born and I was raised in a family of warriors. I was born in the middle of a war. I am the direct recipient of the stories of heroism and the humility of heroes who just obeyed. That's what I always heard. Oh, how could you have, you, you made it, Daddy. 
I just obeyed. The humbleness that comes because they knew their, their compatriots who did not make it, who were just as brave. And gave their lives for the sake of others and freedom. I understand that there are battle plans and that there are strategies on both sides that must be known and implemented by brave and committed soldiers to succeed. I understand that there is good and that there is evil. There is right and there is wrong. And that one must never mix the two and never switch them up. It is to our peril if we do. The Bible says that in the end days, right will be called wrong and wrong will be called right. And we are living in the midst of it and you see it. And that's where you take back and take your stand and you'll be hated for it. Right is right, wrong is wrong. There is a right and there is a wrong and God knows what it is and he's your father and we have the Holy Spirit to teach us. If you're in doubt, he'll tell you, he'll let you know. I understand that our decisions affect many more than myself. I understand that I must be willing to die for my beliefs and therefore count myself dead already. These are hard wartime facts. A good soldier has already determined that he's gonna die. He already knows that. We don't speak about that very much, but they've already, they go into battle knowing it's the only way they can. I've decided. I have decided. And you know that old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's a decision to go to the cross. The only moral compass the world has ever known comes from God, and it's perfected in Jesus Christ. The Bible says it was for freedom that Christ came to set us free. The greatest warrior of all time hung on a cross. And the greatest warrior of all time destroyed the power of the greatest enemy that we all face. God's strategy takes our logic and turns it upside down. I look to Jesus as my example now. I also know who my enemy is now and I now fight the fight of faith. My commander, Jesus Christ, asks for bravery in a way that destroys my confidence in self and my efforts to control. But his strategy topples kingdoms and nations and everything that exalts itself against the truth. His strategy sets the prisoner free brings light into darkness, demolishes lies, destroys the power of death. The enemy of the cross, of God, of the spirit, and of truth is now my enemy. In a very real way, as a new creation, which I am, and now a citizen of the kingdom of God, my ancestors are Abraham, Isaiah, Isaac, Joseph, Sarah, Esther, Ruth, Naomi, Rahab, Deborah, Mary, Rebecca, Peter, Paul, everybody listed in Hebrews 11. They're my ancestors. I have been put into the family of God. You, beloved, are a new creation. You are genetically changed. That's what the Bible says. It is their stories that I look to, for example, in hope. They laid their lives down for my citizenship in the kingdom of God. They are my aunts and uncles, <laughs> my grandparents, my relatives in Christ. Isn't that wild? If you've got a rotten family and you wish you didn't have that family, <laughs> God says, good, you get a new one, and it's a great family, and you get to have it. That's my family now. <laughs> um, the only real genealogy I now share with the ancestors, and I can love them, and I'm a grateful, but really the only ones that I share are the ones I'm going to see in heaven. Their testimony and prayers for me that faithfully came down to me through the ages because of their faith in the promises of God for the generations to come are the one reason I stand here today. 
I thank God for the ancestor who fought for my freedom and who also in my family has inscribed on his tombstone to live as Christ and to die as gain. I love that. I pray I can be that ancestor for someone coming if Jesus tarries. I'm now a member of the household of faith and I take my standing in faith for the generations to follow me. I don't know what the future days may require of me in this war that I'm engaged in as the world turns more and more Hamas. But I know my commander and I pray that I will be found faithful, brave, strong, and doing all in love. As you can see throughout the room and the foyer as you entered, there are many beautiful replicas and vignettes that allude to and mimic the temple. On your table are miniatures of the remnants of the wall of the temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed but is prayed for daily by faithful Jews to be rebuilt. Last month I spoke on how perfectly those stones were hewn before being brought to Jerusalem and put together so that there was no need for any fitting or chiseling when the temple was constructed. So perfectly were the plans God gave to David concerning that temple. Jesus alluded to himself when he proclaimed to John, to, uh, in John, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He was speaking about his own self. He's the temple also. The other theme verse that we carry through the year is 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed, and there we go, and you can see this in the room, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to, to God through Jesus Christ. Um, It goes on to say, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. You and I are those living stones. The word shame here in the Hebrew is also a word used in the previous verse in Isaiah that talks about fleeing a building. And it says that they acted hastily. That verse, that word also in the Hebrew means shame. They fled in shame. Um, it's shameful when we're defeated in battle and when we have to flee from the enemy that has overtaken us. We all know that. We all know that when we blow it and when we fail and we do, there's that shame that comes. And thank God for the blood of Jesus. He's provided for that too. In Christ, he has destroyed that. But we know that... Um, if we, that's why God is saying, come, dwell in my temple. Be where the solid rock is, the cornerstone, so that we're not overtaken. Peter's pointing us back to the prophetic Old Testament that speaks of Jesus. Um, he continues to go on and say that the stone was rejected by its very builders, the Jewish nation. And it is a stumbling stone and a rock of offense to those to whom he came to this day. This is such a poignant reminder for us to pray for Jerusalem and those that have rejected their Messiah. Peter goes on to say, but, I wrote down here, it sounds kind of crazy. This is one of the biggest buts in the Bible. If you receive Jesus, but, if you receive Jesus, you are now a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This is how God considers you, when you accepted his sacrifice of his own son on your behalf, you are chosen, you are royal, you are holy, you are special, you are a praiser, you are called out of darkness, you are in the light, you are the people of God. We that have received Jesus as our own personal Savior and Messiah receive mercy and complete forgiveness of all of our sins, failures, and ignorance. In his mercy, God doesn't just do a makeover he starts from scratch 
and we become born again, Jesus said, a new creation. God is a God of truth and mercy. He is just, and he is also the justifier. He is the judge that is righteous. He judges sin. He judges evil, and he judges impartially, but he's also the God of mercy. God is love, and God required that he find a way to offer mercy to all that would fail the test of righteousness, which is every single one of us. Sin had us all bound to death and condemnation. Who could God find to be his substitute, to take all that condemnation, all the guilty verdict, and allow God to set us free from our sentence to death? and also uh, our bondage to Satan. Only himself, only God himself could be that, could do that. Only God himself had the power. Jesus Christ, God the Son, the beloved only Son, became the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were required to sacrifice a perfect lamb once a year in the Holy of Holies upon the mercy seat where the Ark of the Covenant stood. That sacrifice allowed only one person, the high priest, into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, and it only covered the sins of the people. It did not cleanse them of sin or do away with it. I could spend a year teaching on these truths, but today we're just here to respond to God's offer of complete cleansing, complete forgiveness, complete wholeness, complete healing, complete deliverance, and complete admission into his family and his kingdom. It is deep and it is amazing. It is mysterious in many ways. But God did everything for us, so it's stunningly simple. Just repent, believe, and receive. God only requires faith to receive every and all of his promises. Jesus kept saying, just believe. Repentance just means to turn, acknowledge that we're on the wrong path, that we've made the wrong choice, and to turn and to go the other way to God. The prodigal comes home to the father who puts the robe of righteousness on him and the sonship on him and the ring of the family authority on his finger. His unfaithfulness is remembered no, mo no, no more. Atonement at the mercy seat is just what that word spells, at oneness, at one meant. We come back and we are able to be one with God. I am in Jesus, Jesus is in the Father. The Father is in Jesus, Jesus is in me. Jesus' prayer in the God of Father, may they be one as you and I are one. Do you think God didn't answer the prayer of his son? He did, he did. We are one with God, with Jesus. Know that, believe that. When you walk, when you talk, Jesus talks, he lives in you. And the miracles that Jesus did, you will do also, believe. The days are coming when God is gonna say, step out, get on that horse. <laughs> I'm a horsewoman, gallop off. You might not see the footing. You might not know where the, the, the log or the hole is. Trust and step out and go. If you have come here today and have not accepted Jesus' offer of salvation and his invitation to have all sin forgiven through his blood and his sacrifice of himself for you on the cross, you can do so right now. If you're not sure that you're saved and that Jesus Christ is your Lord, you can pray that and have that settled now, today. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Romans 10, nine through 10. So in closing, just pray with me. And uh, as soon as I'm done praying, I'm gonna invite you all, we're gonna come to the mercy seat 
um, to, the, to the table, and we're going to serve communion this morning. Ring, um, I would encourage you to just ha have a little quiet time at your table, um, meditate on anything here that was said that might have struck you as, as a, a need for prayer, anyone you might need to forgive, and then come to the table and receive all that you need. I really strongly believe that in women's ministry, as we women gather here together, this is just a foundational uh, moment for us as women. We're going to go forth knowing we are one in Christ. We are hearing the Lord call. The Good Shepherd is calling us. We have a mission to do, ladies. We have things to accomplish. We have a calling. We have a world to go to. We have a war to fight. We have a commander-in-chief who has called us to get into rank. Get into your rank. So come to the table and be prepared. Father, we just come before you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for saving us. Thank you, Father God, for Jesus. We believe and know that he is you, your perfect sacrifice. I thank you, Father, for those that are here today that will make that decision, Lord. We just thank you and praise you that you are here to meet us. So you, if you're wanting to make that um, commitment and that step in Christ Jesus, just uh, pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you were crucified and died for me, that your blood was shed for me, that I am a sinner, and I have been dead in sin, but you make me alive in Christ Jesus. You, O oh God, are Lord of lords and King of kings. Jesus is Lord. If you've said that prayer, confess it to somebody. Um, We've created an interpretation of the Ark of the Covenant here with the seraphim spreading their wings over the mercy seat. So as you're invited to come to table in communion, you might be reminded and experience the wholeness of the truth of God's word and reminded of his sacrifice for you personally. In the Old Testament, we know that the mercy seat that the blood just covered sin but here we come to this mercy seat in Christ and we are washed white as snow we are completely forgiven in his blood and if you prayed that prayer of salvation for the first time you are welcome to come to the table